And so I want you to know that before I preach to you all, I first preach to me, okay? And thank you for the privilege of being able to have the time to do so. Because of your gifts and because of your um, generosity, I can have time to do these things and to connect with God and also ask him, uh, what would you have for each and every one of us? So thank you for that. So our main uh, passage that we're going to be looking at for this series is Ephesians chapter 4. And so to give you a preview of that, um, we're not going there today, but that's where we're going to go for the rest of the, of the series. I want you to read that passage, be thinking about it. It'd be great if you would focus in on the whole book of Ephesians, but in particular Ephesians chapter 4, where Paul instructs us through the Holy Spirit as to our life together. Now, today, before we dive into Ephesians 4, we're going to dial it back and look at a passage where the word church was first mentioned in the New Testament. Now, the first time the word church is used, it comes out of whose mouth? Whose mouth? Anybody know? I heard someone say Jesus, right? If you don't know the answer in Sunday school... Say Jesus, and you'll probably be right, okay? <clears throat> it's interesting to note the first time in the New Testament the wor- where the word church was used, it comes out of the mouth of Jesus, which tells us that the church is his idea. It was not just a construct of men or women, but it is the work of God himself. Jesus used the word church in response to Peter when Peter recognized who Jesus really was. And from this revelation, Jesus said that he would build his church, and also that the gates of hell itself would never overcome it, and the church would have power in both heaven and on earth. The church is not a fortress, it is a force. The church is not a place. This is just the building in which we gather. We call, let's go to church, but this is the building. You are the church. The church is a person, the body of Christ, which is you and me. It's not a place. It's a person. The church is not an organization, it is a organism that has life and moves and grows and changes and thinks and responds. The church is his and he loves it. It is built on Jesus. It is built by Jesus. And it is built for Jesus. Did you just hear me there? And if you and I understand who Jesus really is and choose to join him at his invitation. Christ will wash you. He will change you from the inside to the outside. Christianity, you've heard this before, is not a religion that works from the outside to the inside. Christianity is based in a person, Christ, 
who changes us from the inside that reflects to the outside. You hear the difference. He will change you, making you in his image. So that you, so that I, so that we can join him in what he is doing in the world. So my hope is to elevate our idea, your idea of what church is. It is beyond programs and places. It is powerful. It is eternal. It changes the whole world. It is alive, it is active, and it's making a difference. This is the life together that we are called to. And the church is worth giving your life to and giving your life for. Why? Because Jesus himself did so. And he asks us to do the same. Now, from our passage this morning, and if you do have a Bible, please open up to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. First book in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 16 starting with verse 13 through 19. That is our focus of this morning. So up until the point of our passage today in Matthew, the gospel tells about the story of Jesus. And people during that time where he was physically walking the earth We're fascinated by him. He was a person that the whole nation was talking about. There was no one who said the things that he did. And they were trying to figure out who this man was. Was he a true prophet of God? Or was he a false deceiver of the people? Was he, as some thought, Perhaps John the Baptist reincarnated, come back to life. Was he the Elijah that came before the Messiah? Or perhaps this might have been the Messiah himself. There was controversy about his true identity that permeated the countryside, permeated the city. And everywhere he went, people wanted to just get a glimpse of him, to hear him, to see what he would do, and understand what he was saying. He had drawn specific disciples closer to himself to train them, and he was moving around the nation, talking about the good news of the kingdom, heightened curiosity, heightened wonderment, and the crowds and the murmuring and the conflict was continuing to escalate. So Jesus was with his 12 disciples and others who were following, and they headed to a place called Caesarea Philippi. This was just north of the Sea of Galilee, just north of Capernaum, where the disciples, a lot of the disciples were around the Sea of Galilee, and they were going up to this place. And in this city, there was a temple to the God-man Caesar. The Romans built this place there, and this is where was a center of Caesar worship or the God man. 
And as Jesus and his disciples were traveling to this town, he asked them a question. Who do people say that I am? So here we are, Matthew chapter 16. We're picking up the story in verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the direction of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, now who are people saying that the Son of Man is? And he called himself Son of Man at this point. And they said, well, some people are saying, you're John the Baptist, come back to life. At this point, John the Baptist was killed in prison. Do you know the story? His head was cut off for confronting the Roman power. Now others say, that you're Elijah. And if you know your Old Testament, last book called Malachi talked about a Elijah that would come to prepare the way of the Messiah. So in saying that, well, they think that you might be Elijah, that is the one to prepare the way of the Messiah, they're saying that you are connected to the Messiah, but not the Messiah. But there was this anticipation and perhaps, well, and misunderstanding of who he was. And others say you're Jeremiah come back, confronting evil and bringing people back to repentance. Or perhaps one of the prophets. Now there are and were many opinions of who Jesus is. In Jesus' day when he was physically present on the earth, there was mixed opinions about his identity. Today there are mixed opinions about his identity. People of other religions may think that he is a prophet, but not the Messiah. Others think, of course, he was a fraud. Many, including many in this country, think he was a moral teacher. And, of course, there are those who believe, indeed, he was the Son of God. He is God incarnate. Just as there were opinions in his day, there are opinions in our day as well. And knowing his identity matters. It matters then and it matters today. You, you online, and I... We cannot base our opinion on who Christ is based on what others say about him. You, each one of us, have to make up our own minds, each one of us, as to who we think he is. This is the question that God himself asks us. And this is the question that God himself is asking you. You and you and you. Asking you. Asking you this morning. Who do you think that I am? Verse 15, we read, and Jesus, after asking his disciples who others say that the M, gets really personal with them, and he gets really personal with us this morning. He said to them, but who did you say that I am? Simon 
whose name was changed in this passage by Jesus to Peter, replied, You, Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the God who lives, the living God. Jesus turned to Peter and he answered him. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But the Father in heaven has revealed this. To you. So Simon, again, whose name was changed to Peter, identified Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He was the Word that became flesh, He was the hope of the nations. He was the one who came to save his people from their sins. He was the hope of the world. He was a gentle healer, the author of life, the forgiver of sins. The one and only begotten son of the Father. The true king over every king, over all times, places, peoples, and nations. And having this understanding does not come by pure observation or calculation. It is a revelation given by the living God who is in heaven. No one stumbles into finding Christ God himself reveals Christ's true identity to hearts and minds. It is a miracle when anyone recognizes the true identity of Jesus. If you believe he is the Son of God, you are a miracle. You've been touched by God, the Creator himself. God opens hearts and minds of people to the true identity of the Son of God. And His identity changes your identity. You go from death to life. You go from lost to found. You go from forgotten to forgiven. You go from temporal to eternal. You go from being bound to being set free. You and I have a new name and a new identity. Because he gives these things to you. From the revelation of who he truly is. Verse 18, Jesus says, And I tell you, you are Peter. Name change, identity change. And on this rock, I will build my church. The very gates of hell, death itself, shall, should not 
win the day, will not overcome, shall not prevail against it. The church is built on Jesus. Who Jesus says you are is who you truly and rightly are. Did you catch that? Who Jesus says you are is who you are. Not a coach, not a parent, not a bully, not a co-worker. Not your spouse, not your children, not your grand. Parents, who Jesus says you are is who you truly are. And he is, has that authority because he created you. If you create something, you have the authority to name that thing. Catch this. I want you to understand what God says about you because that's who you are. By his rights as the creator, he calls you what you are, and you are his. You are beloved. You are cherished. You are his child. You matter to him. He changed Simon, which means the one who hears. Changed his name to Peter, said, you are a rock, you are a stone. He tells us who we are, and he tells you who you truly are. Don't believe the names and nicknames that have been given to you. Believe what God says about you. Grow into that identity. Peter, excuse me, Simon was changed because he understood the true identity of Jesus. He was now a stone. He was solid. The one who was to be built into the church as a living stone built upon the cornerstone, the rock the massive rock who is Christ, the rock. The church is built on Jesus because Jesus is the foundation of the church. Amen. He is the one on which it is built. His identity is as the Son of God, the Christ, the cornerstone. The church has the only foundation which will stand the test of time. It is the only building that will be able to withstand to eternity. The church has its foundation on Christ. His identity is what we are built upon. It is solid and sure because it is the rock that has been not formed by human hands. It is eternal, and eternal it will stand. You see this imagery throughout the Old Testament. You see this imagery of rocks being hewn. And you see the rock even in the wilderness, all pointing to Christ, all pointing to his foundation and the church. Christ is the sure foundation, and Christ is the only foundation in which the church is built upon. The church has not been formed by human hands. Not on the system and the wisdom of men. The church is not built on a platform of people or celebrity pastors 
but by the will of the king. It is his idea. He is the one who gives the church its sure foundation. He is the one it's built upon. His reputation. His faithfulness. His righteousness. His love. His protection. His perfection. And he is the rock that will never be moved. Aren't you grateful that church isn't built on um, fallen men and women? It's built on the perfect one. This rock will never be moved. All who stumble on Christ will be broken to pieces. And all on whom he falls will be scattered like dust. I want you to recognize that the church is built on Christ. He is the foundation on an organizational chart and belief statements and nice buildings built on Christ and it's built by Jesus. Did you notice that statement, I will build my church. If I asked you who builds the church, I want to hear the answer, Christ builds the church. I will build my church. He is the one who builds his church. He is the one who gives to us what we need when we need it. He is the one that puts the pieces together. He is the one who brings us what we need need and the gifts that are here he is doing the building because it's his building i remind christ weekly in my prayer time i'm not kidding you this is yours this is your idea god will you give to us what we need when we need it and the promise is he will and we can say amen to that which helps tremendously, especially for those who have a responsibility of overseeing the church. Ultimately, the church is built by him, which takes the pressure off of me. I'm so glad that the church isn't built on me. It'd be bad, believe me. And it takes the pressure off. God, this is your church. You're building it. And knowing this helps us to rest and to trust. Helps us to call on him, to lean on him, to look to him, to trust in him. This provides a lot of comfort, believe me. And a lot of humility. And because he is the one who builds the church, he is the one who deserves the credit for the church. Amen to that. He is the one that's building. He is the one who's providing the part. He is the one who's giving direction. We are the ones who have responsibility to listen to him and do what he's asking. That's all I ask you as your pastor. Listen to Christ and obey him. God, what are you saying? Christ, what are you doing? Listen. Follow. Bring about the obedience of faith. This church was bombed out. If this building was bombed out, what would you do? What would you do if you were scattered? What what would you do if you were living in Afghanistan right now? And you were being systematically hunted. I do remember, and you do remember, those of you who were alive, the day after September 11th. 
you remember that? Do you remember the first church service back? We draw near to the Almighty when we're in trouble, but when we're not in trouble, we'll see you when I'm in trouble again. You know I'm telling the truth right now. God delights when we draw close to him, but we have opportunity to do that all the time. Sometimes God allows trouble in our life to give us external motivation to draw near to him. The church is built by Jesus. The church is built for Jesus. I will build my church. The church is his. It is built on him, it is built by him, it is built for him. He is the one that it's for. Catch this, this is important. He is the one who owns the church. God help us from thinking that it's ours. That it's something that we build, that it's for us. It is for you, but it's not about you. It's about him. We are his. We are his body. You are I am. I want you to think about the church as Christ thinks about the church. We are part of his church. We are his and he is ours. We do not own him. He owns us. <laughs> Built for Jesus. Not for any pastor, not for any platform, not for any influence, but for him and his glory. Right? Catch this. It's important. Help to reorientate Ourselves to as to what God is doing, what he's creating, what it's about. It's for Christ. And understanding that keeps us away from me and mine. We serve at his pleasure. We work because he's at work. The day that we think the church is ours... As in we own it, we're a part of it, yes, but we don't own it, is the day that we cut off a piece of the vine. And we disconnect it from the source of life. And what we hold in our hands, if we cut it from the true vine, will die in our hands. You understand the imagery here? He is divine, we are the branches. If we're disconnected from him, if we say, hey, this is mine, you, dis- you disconnect what's in your hand away from the source of life, and in time this will die. You and I are given a privilege to be part of the church. Privilege. And perhaps given responsibility for some portion of it, but it's never yours and it's never mine. We don't own it, it it owns us. (laughs) We are a part of it, but it's his because we are his. He can do with it as he pleases. 
And he will deal with those who try to take it from him. He deals with a strong hand those who take what is his as their own. The good news from his statement is the church will prevail. The gates of hell itself will not prevail against it. There is no other group of people who are able to stand against the gates of hell. By the way, the gates of hell is the entrance to death. All groups, all companies, all governments, all man-made monuments will not be able to stand against the gates of hell. The church will not be dismantled, defeated, or destroyed by the devil, by demons, or even by death. It will never be destroyed. It will never be dismantled. It will never be defeated. The great destroyer of all things, even death itself, will not destroy the people of God nor the kingdom of God. Try as they might. You and I, because we are in Christ, will rise again. Death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? This is a promise only to the church, not to Nike, not to Apple, not to Amazon, not to any nation. The gates of hell will come against what God is building, but God will overcome everything, even supernatural powers. Only the church will prevail, and it also has power that affects both heaven and earth. Verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Heaven. What does this mean? Number one, the church will unlock the kingdom. This is keys. They're meant to open things. The church has been given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. The keys to the kingdom of heaven is the message of the gospel itself. That's the key. Heaven is open through the gospel. And we have been given the gospel, empowered by the work of the Spirit, revealed by the Father, and completed by the Son. We have the message of the kingdom. And only those who enter through the door of the gospel, which is provided and communicated by the church, will enter the kingdom. You can open the kingdom of heaven for people by communicating the gospel of the king. You are not the key, Jesus is. We have been given the message of the gospel by the power of the Spirit, completed in the Son, to tell people about, to open the door through the gospel. The church will unlock the kingdom. And the church will affect and does affect both heaven and earth. The church is the channel or the conduit or the corridor of the kingdom where heaven interacts, flows through his church to the world. And whatever we hold, withhold from earth, will be withheld from heaven. Whatever we give to earth will be given from heaven. Your prayers matter. Matter. God chooses to use the mechanism of prayer 
to open the gates of heaven and to affect earth. Who has been given that privilege? The church. Why? Because we pray in Jesus' name. Are you hearing this? You are a powerful force because you are connected to the great king. You are an ambassador of the kingdom. Understand your role, what God has done and what God is doing. You matter because he matters. The church affects both heaven and earth. It is by his provision and his power in response to our interaction and involvement. He is the sovereign and he will do as he pleases and he uses his people empowered by his spirit to do the work of heaven and the stuff of earth. (laughs) What the word says has power and his word in our mouth has power. You and I have the position and the power to make a difference in the world for eternity because we are the body of Christ. Eternity is changed. We are playing for keeps. Keeps. Church is worth it because Christ is worth it. We are his body on earth. He has no body on earth besides ours. Collectively, we move in response to the head. God, keep us connected to the head, Christ. What are you doing? What are you saying? Where are you going? How do you want me to respond? To do his will for the good of the world and the glory of the Father. The church is built on Jesus. The church is built by Jesus. The church is built for Jesus. We are his. And he is ours. You, you, you are part of the most precious powerful, and prevailing people in the universe. We will last forever because he is forever. (laughs) We will have life eternal because he is life eternal. We are precious because we are precious to him. I want you to understand what a miracle you are. What a miracle this is. The church continues from that day to this day throughout the world. It is God's work. And let us thank God for his glory, for connecting us to what he's doing and has done through time and eternity. Value what God has given to us. Give yourself to what he is doing. And understand what a privilege it is for us to be in his body, to be in his church, to have a part to play. That's a privilege. I want to encourage us to give thanks to the Lord for the gift of being part of the building that he is building, living stone. Let us give thanks for the invitation to join him and his family. That extends across all generations and all people groups and all nations for all time. For him, by him, through him, for his glory and our joy. So I'm going to pray for us and we're going to sing. And I want you to think about this passage. Think about what God's doing. Think about what your role is. I'm going to encourage us as a congregation to understand deeper and wider what the church is based upon what Christ says to us. 
That's what we're doing. So I'm going to pray for us. And if you have certain prayer requests, be a couple right up over here at the end of the service to pray for you. Remember, when you go out to take these off, find one of those boards, stick it on there. It's going to be pretty cool when we're all done. You can do it again next week. You can do it again next week. If you're online, you can type your name in. Okay, We'll make these for you. Just stick on these boards. I want you to be a part as well. So God, here we are at the end, near the end of this message. And God, my prayer, our prayer is this. God, that you would expand our understanding of your true identity and what that means. That we would fall deeper in love with you. And so doing, that we would be deeper in love with what you love. Which is truth and righteousness. Which is honor and joy. Which is love and unity. Which is healing and truth. Which is seen in the lives of your church through all generations that we are a part of. Build your kingdom here, God, we pray. Show us our identity in you. Show us your heart for the nations as we sung about today. Help us see who you are so that we can see what matters most. Be glorified. Do your work in us, God. Do your work. And we thank you for this beautiful gift of the church. Jesus' name, amen.